Hi, it's Gadget UK here again, back for part three, I think it is, of the A3000 Archimedes repairs. Thanks to Xavier for sending these. The way we left things in part two, I think I'd uh, just removed the power supply and was inspecting it and stuff, and there was some corrosion on the top of the uh, can there. So this video starts with me cleaning the corrosion off that can, actually. So periodically I'm just going to get a little bit of uh, WD-40 just to wipe this to get the uh, rust, you know, particles off there like that, dust and stuff, just so I can see what state it's in. This bit is the main bit, you want to focus on something like this because you do want a really, really, really good earth. So because it's quite thick, as you can see, I'm using a bit of sandpaper here as well and that's actually doing a really, really good job at getting the last bits. You know, if you look at this here, this was all really ready before it's coming off. I had to peel back a little bit here because uh, the rust had gone underneath there. But I mean, I'll stick a bit of tape on that in a minute and we'll tape this flat back over once we've uh, got that back down again. So I could literally spend ages on this, uh, but that's as good as I'm going to get it on the inside there. And uh, on the outside, yeah, it's not so bad. I might just give it another quick go here because this is the bit where we want a really good connection and this side here is really tarnished. But I've gone over that an awful lot and I can't seem to get it back any better than that. It's difficult because it's such a small uh, piece of metal there and you're hindered by the side bits here. A Dremel or something with a grinding wheel. You could perhaps get that all looking super, super, super shiny. So there we go, that's about as clean as that's going to get. I'm just wiping over the label here with some uh, IPA now. Just uh, carefully just uh, flip that back that way. And we'll clean over the top of it in a minute when I've stuck it back down. But you can see all those marks are coming off the label. It's just like dirt that's got on the top of the power supply there. Oh, I always miss a bit. I need to do that. So the power supply is back in place. The uh, earth that comes from outside was on the inside of the thing there, like that. This earth strap here went onto there. like that, just make sure that's firmly on, yeah it is, uh, and then the live and neutral goes on here, and then our shield just sits over like that, and if everything's lined up properly, if we get the screw back in, I'm hoping this is the right screw, I could have sworn it was a more of a grey screw, and if we tighten that up, yeah, that's it. That's holding in place there. And we stick our uh, sticker back down there. I'll just give this a wipe because it's a bit dirty on top. And I'll just stick a piece of tape, maybe captain tape or something, just over that. Yeah, that's not too bad. We don't even need to take that down, I don't think. So because some of this has obviously been corroded off, it's making a bit of what I would say a sloppy fit, that. I'm not happy with that. I've sprayed contact cleaner in there, by the way. So what I'm going to do is just uh, crimp it a little bit here, just uh, not a lot, and then just retry it. It's a bit tighter that, let's just do a little bit more, maybe in the middle. Yeah, that's much better. Well, it never stops giving this one, in terms of faults. Uh, yeah, the floppy disk is playing up. So I did spend some time, I recapped this one, and I gave it a quick clean. I can't remember whether I fully lubricated it and fully stripped it down, but it's intermittent. It's like, so you can put the disc in and out and do what it says, press space bar, and it might not read it, and eject the disc again, put the disc back in, press the space bar, let's just try that. And it may, or may not read, no, it's given us an error, so if we just put it out, put it back in, press space again. Same thing, but you can repeat this a number of times and it will start working. I think this is the one that uh, Zarkos had a label on. It didn't come inside this 3000 originally, this one. This one said it was unreliable. 
and it is unreliable. I'm just not sure why. Oh, it's doing it there. Yeah, you can hear it's loading there. There are a few reseeks there. So an important point, you saw I was messing with the floppy drives earlier and I did spend close to three or four, maybe five hours yesterday until messing with floppy drives. The problem was the disc was not great and there was a bit of dirt come off that disc into the A3010. So when I'd been formatting the disc and trying to put Pack Mania back on there and testing it in these two drives and this 3000 here, I was getting errors roughly at the same place of the disc each time. Despite the fact on the 3010, it seemed to be working. I messed around with a number of things in these drives, I'll show you. So just bear in mind, if you start getting disc problems, do not just jump to the conclusion it's the drive, because I had these two drives stripped down, I swapped the boards around, I swapped the cats around, messed with the track zero sensor, which I'll show you, I need to tighten that. Um, I swapped the PCBs between them. I, I did all sorts of things. I ended up uh, ultimately stripping down the 3010 disk drive again, cleaning the heads, reassembling it, formatting the disks. One disk I found with some bad tracks on it, the other one's fine. Copied the game back over and it's worked. But I kid you not, I spent four or five hours on this yesterday. So it's screwed in there. I'm going to be a bit naughty and I'm just going to carefully try and hook under the end there to lift that up. I can bend that back in a minute. I don't like doing this because you do need to use pliers. There you go to bend that. Can you see I've got a little bend there, a little bend there. So I'll straighten those out. But this is the one that I messed around with the track zero sensor. The screw, that screw there, I don't think it's tightened. No, it's not. I'm glad I remembered to go back in. Just make sure that's tight. It is. As you saw on that 1200 drive from hell, floppy drive from hell on the Amiga, you can do these screws and that, that sensor can move like that a little bit. So I played around with that, I lubricated the rail again, I messed around trying to put it, tighten these screws up here, I was messing with this counterweight, there's a weight on the back here. I took that off, it didn't make a difference, put it back on, it didn't make a difference, I was messing around putting pressure around here. All sorts of things, as I say, including the stuff I described earlier, swapping the boards and the caps and all sorts of things. Ultimately none of that was needed, I completely wasted my time. So I've straightened that one there just by uh, crimping it at that point. Might be able to see got a little kink there. So this is super uh, fragile metal. This is like aluminium, I think. There you go, it's gone back into profile there. So with this one, it's got this analog port here that we're gonna need to remove first. So I'll have to remove these screws holding it into the uh, back here. This of course will mean that this one's got uh, a gap then on the back, you know, it's not got the blanking plate there, but I might have a spare one or something we can fit in here. It's a shame it can't accommodate more than uh, one uh, thing here, you know, this is one of the, of the benefits of the uh, bigger box models, like a, a 440. Yeah, I think there might be a screw missing in this board, I'm not sure, Let's see if we can find one to secure it if there is. Uh, anyway, there we go, that's that out. After the record, you can see what that is there. HCCS user analog port. It provides a user port and an analog port. So Xavier kindly provided some upgrades for these A3000s. Now, not just the 3000s, the 3010s. In fact, the first two 3010s have gone. You know, those have been sold. And uh, I've you know, split the profits, as I said I would, with the Xavier. He kindly, after the second one sold, I think he reduced it and said, uh, you know, you didn't want as much uh, money, just like 20%. That's, so that's really helped big time with these. But he provided these RAM upgrade boards as well. You can see it's, uh, you know, it's one of these Eiffel ones, is it? Yeah, it is, look, uh, that need a 72-pin SIM here. So I purchased some SIMs to go with these. These are the two we've still got left that will go into some of the A3000s. But he also provided three or so, I think, IDE podules. He got those a really good deal, actually, at one of the Acorn uh, user group shows. I think he got them for like £20 each, which is an absolute bargain. So I've made sure that Xavier's got the money back for these RAM expansions uh, and the, uh, the boards that he's provided uh, for the IDE as well. But that was really nice of him to do that. It's going above and beyond, and it's just me meant that we could sell the first uh, two or three of these. I think two of the 3010s have gone, and one of the A3000s has sold already. Um, and they've had these upgrades in there, which has made them really desirable to someone to purchase. So thank you for that, Xavier. Uh, and I think he also included these. I've just found these in here. I'm not even sure what these are for. It looks like a, a mouse uh, keyboard combo thing. So I don't know whether you put a, an like a DIN or something on here. Um, 
I'm not really sure. You might comment down below. I could be mistaking these from something else that's just where they've slipped into the box. I'm not sure. But we'll have a look at those some other point in future as well. So I'll get the uh, Heidi uh, disc on module uh, thing here. And it plugs in like that. And as you can see, that one's working as well. Just testing a bit of gods on this. The volume's not come through the TV at the moment. It's super quiet from the speakers here. As you can hear. So I've been testing the sims I've got here, uh, and you know what I'm like, I always like to test things all sorts of different ways. So I'm just testing without a module in here. And as you can see, you get a red screen. Now that's a good sign, because what I would want to try and do is just test that it was actually checking this RAM here, it wasn't just assuming it was okay. Um, uh, and obviously it's going to be utilised, it needs to utilise this, it's not going to boot without some RAM there, that's the, the main thing here. Uh, but the point uh, is also that this is automatically disabling the onboard RAM. That was the main purpose of that test really there. To see that if there was a problem with this, would it automatically be falling back to this or, you know, how's that working? Because on a 3010, as you saw, you've got to change some jumpers. On this, you don't seem to. You just plug the module in, it works. So I'm guessing there was some pin, a pin or two on here that, uh, you know, uh, pull a signal low or high to let the board know actually we've got a module in here and it's maybe it's even the size maybe you know there's another pin to say or a couple of pins to determine whether it's 2 meg or 4 meg etc i don't think you can go beyond 4 meg you can um the archimedes can be upgraded beyond 4 meg in general I'm not sure how easy it would be to do on this so on a 3010 you've got to daisy chain sort of a, a number of mmcs together so i think in theory you could go up to 16 meg by use of four uh, of the mmc uh, module mmc yeah, the MMC, that's right, the MMC chip. You'd need four of those. Um, maybe at some point Stephen Leary might have a look at something like this or someone uh, similar, similarly talented. I don't think anybody's as talented as Stephen, but anyway, someone similarly skilled may be able to have a look at these and maybe give us a 16 meg module or something, but it might only work on certain board revisions, I don't know. It might even need something that clips over the uh, MMC chip. I've got no idea. So the other thing I noticed before I powered this up, and I didn't mention it, the battery was completely flat, so I thought, oh, good, good grief, here we go again. It's going to be a similar sort of thing we had with the A3010 uh, there, where maybe uh, a diode has uh, failed or something, or maybe the circuit's different on this, I'll have a look at the schematics in a minute. But we did a CR232 uh, mod in a previous video when I repaired this. Um, it seems to have stood the test of time in terms of corrosion. This hasn't been used for a few months. I don't see any discoloration. That's always a good sign as well. If you're going to repair one of these before you sell it, you know, obviously test it for a period of time on the battery and make sure the battery's not draining. I mean, there's things you can do in advance to make sure the battery's not going to drain. You know, I'll just show you. Continuity test here. The first thing, the first clue here. Um, if I go from one of the VCC pins, you know, the highest, the, upper, the uppermost pin on one of these uh, TTL chips here, oh, actually it's going to be CMOS, hate to see is, uh, and measure to the uh, pin there. We've got a short. We shouldn't have a short. So when you put the battery in, the, you, the voltage of the battery here, you can see it going down, down, down very, very quickly. Just with a brand new battery, that's not right. And if I measure here, it's like 0.44 of a volt. And if I measure here, it's 0.44 of a volt. So this battery is powering the whole blooming board again. It's just like we saw on the A3010 uh, there. So I'm not sure whether this is the one that I uh, did all of the fixes to, or whether this is the one that had been looked at by somebody else and had lots of wires underneath. Something might be wrong there. Like, I, maybe this is going straight to the battery instead of through a diode. Uh, maybe it works differently on here. Uh, is that the diode? There's a diode there. Let's just, just let's test that diode there. Um, yeah, it's not that one. I might just have a measure around to see if there's any diodes, but uh, anyway, there is an issue with the real time clock on this, so I'll have a look at that in a second. So it's a good job I did come back in here. There were a few caps I needed uh, to deal with. Can you see this? This one here has got a crack. Um, in fact, that one's got the top missing. It's like the top part of it's just gone. And this one here, I'd look like it's broken too. There was a little line down the middle of it. I thought, actually, that's fractured. And the solder points were crusty anyway. Uh, the resistor here, you can see, I've, uh, hopefully I've reflowed that. I got all the crusty solder off there. Put some fresh solder on. Used the fiberglass pen a little bit. Um, and that one's okay. That's just the uh, 180 ohm resistor on the ground side of the battery there. But nevertheless, these are things that needed to be done. They were perhaps the last things. I've also, uh, can you see these little pads here as well? There were little, two little jump positions here, like links. Um, and they just looked a little bit oxidised, despite the fact that I've cleaned up. So I've just covered those with little blobs of solder. 
I'll just clean up here. So I need now two caps to replace this, these here. Uh, and the one there that was broken, the pad was uh, lifted on that side. Um, you know, it was free. It had come free from the corrosion. So um, I've tinned the bit of the trace below it. I should be able to stretch a cap across to that trace, I think, rather than using a, a long bodge wire of some sort. But if we just have a clean around here now, I'll go and try and find two replacement caps to replace the one here. C18, I think it is, and C17. Hopefully they're just 100 nanofarad. So I've fitted some replacement uh, caps there. Those are both 33 nanofarads. I'm guessing a lot of the bypass caps around here will be uh, 33s, not 100s. But you know what? If you've not got a 33, 100 will be fine. Uh, maybe a bit less, try and go with a 47 or uh, 82 or something like that. But you could fit a 100 nanofarad cap there, probably be okay. Um, it's just providing a bit of uh, decoupling. The points on this one here, can you see they look a bit more blobby? That's deliberate. This point here, because obviously we lost the pad. Uh, so yeah, it's not quite as tidy as I would like, but uh, that will do the job. It'll be reliable, it's making a good connection. Anyway, so we need to sort that battery thing out next. I know what that is. Um, when I did the mod earlier, I joined the uh, cathode of the uh, diode from here straight to one of the pins um, on the VCC rail, I think, instead of where it should have gone, which is the cathode, uh, sorry, the anode of this diode here. I think that's right. Do you know, I'm so good at not following my own advice. Uh, I'm sure I've mentioned in the past, don't solder to tiny little wires. So, I mean, it was soldered to the wrong place, the diode. That's the first thing. Um, you can see now, it's, uh, it's anode goes to the battery. The cathode wants to just literally go straight to the VCC pin on that chip, which is pin 8 there. That's all you need to do. It really is that simple. Uh, which side's got the IPA, that one. Um, but because I joined it to the wire here, wrong wire, going to a different pin, um, the, uh, when I pulled it off, it broke the uh, wire. So I had to plug that wire. You can see we put a wire here. It's, it could be a bit shorter. And it's a little bit extended there, but I pushed it through and soldered it on the other side. Uh, and then when I tried to join it to this wire, which does go to pin 8, I didn't realise it went this way. Uh, obviously broke that one off, so I've had to plug that one with a wire as well. So I've now got two extra wires as a result of me trying to solder onto blooming wires. Don't do it. Um, even if they're not corroded, they're so small, they're like a pinhead. You know, I don't know, a quarter of a millimetre in size. Maybe a millimetre in size. They're, they're super small though. Anyway, that should work now. So I'll get a new battery in, and I'm going to go test it and uh, see what's going on with the uh, voltage levels there now. Hopefully, when the system's off, the battery will be powering this chip. We'll see 3 volts there. Because what was happening before, I don't know if I mentioned, it was like 0.4 of a volt when the power was off. Because obviously it was trying to power the whole system. Now, I know that diode's okay, so I'm curious as to where I joined it up. I must have joined it up completely, you know, to completely the wrong place. So if we just measure the voltage now, I'll just uh, connect the ground up to one of the ground points on the, one of these 74 series chips here. And if we measure pin 8, you see that? 3.1 volts. Uh, and you can measure the battery there as well, like that, 3.29. If you saw that going down, like 3.28, 3.27, 3.26, over a, you know, a few seconds, you know that it's connected to the wrong place. You know, it needs to be connected, the cathode of that diode needs to be connected to pin 8, as you can see, to feed just over uh, 3 volts to that pin there. These things will work down to about 1 volt, so that battery will last quite a while, I would think. I was surprised when it was flat earlier on. So on to the next one. Uh, I'm going to remove the 1 meg upgrade here, so this one's got uh, 2 megabytes in total. I'm not sure whether this is 1 meg on here or this has got 2. I suspect this has got 2 meg, disabling the onboard 1 meg, which is uh, a really weird way of working, but that was perhaps the easiest way for them to do these back in the day. They're quite hard to get out these sometimes. Yeah, you can see it's well and truly stuck on there. You need to pull it up on one side and pull it up on the other. The drive is inhibiting. This is the problem. Well, it wasn't easy and I couldn't capture it. I spent that long trying to get the thing out. The easy way I found to get it out was to get some pliers on there, under that river and try and pull it, and then do this opposite on this side here, just 
on this side here I just managed to just hold the PCB and pull it up but yeah I've got that off uh, there's the screw so you should wear an ESD wrist strap when handling uh, these memory modules uh, it goes that way in and the sim goes this way here I think have I got that the right way around? maybe I haven't yeah it goes that way that's interesting it looks different to the other one I had yeah it does it mounts the, the other one I've got the, the sim mounts the other way around this one looks like it goes that way and pushes forward like that until these clip on on each side and it looks like it goes in that way because as you can see these two connectors are nearer together there's a big gap there and if you look at these here there's a big gap here and no gap there so it's interesting the sim goes in this way and lifts up whereas the other one that was an older one it goes in this way and lifts up and it kind of with bigger sims it got kind of restricted on the drive so this must be a slightly later board revision for the eiffel there versus the uh, the one we had in the other machine so if we uh, switch that on now, hopefully we should have 4 meg in that one and then I'll uh, connect up the final uh, ID module here yeah there we go, 4 meg so I'll switch it off so I'll move the wires out of the way while I uh, slide that into position there we go, hopefully this one will work too it's a good test because we haven't tested the actual uh, port there to understand whether that's connected up properly as it should be And if we hit F12, uh, is it podules? Oh, I can't even spell. And if we type podules, yeah, it says podule 1 ID interface, so it's picked it up. I'll just run the commands and we'll reboot it. And these ID podules are just the same as the one I showed on my channel before. It's the, it uses the Zide FS, you know, Zide file system, whatever it is. So you've just got these uh, four uh, configure commands here to enable the drive. So I ran all the configure commands there. Let's see what happens now. Yeah, it's picked up the uh, ID interface there. Oh, mouse isn't connected now. So these uh, never end. I'm getting a bit frustrated with these, to say the least. The previous one, the sound was quite quiet, I noticed. And just listen, I'm t toggling here between. This is loud. That's quiet. Loud. Quiet. Just in the configure thing there, it's noticeably different to the other one. This one's nice and loud. The other one, you can hardly hear. So unless there's a board revision, um, someone must have done a mod. Now I forget, you'll perhaps remember, but earlier on I had to revert an audio mod on one of these. There were some caps lifted and things like that. I'm wondering if someone cut traces and that was the, perhaps the other one. This one perhaps is the one that was okay, I'm not sure. I suspect this is the one that had the audio mod, I reverted and it's okay. So quite why the other one is quiet, I don't know, but I'm going to need to take the other one back to pieces again and try and work out why the audio is half as loud as this one. So with regards to the volume level, inspected pretty thoroughly around here and I can't find anything. And I've noticed some uh, things here and I don't know whether this is from whoever did the audio mod to this previously or whether it's something I did. There's uh, a corner of, uh, I think it's one of these caps here, is it this one? Uh, they're chipped off, uh, which could be affecting it. It's only uh, one nanofarad, that. So I've ordered a ceramic to replace that. This one's a polyester, can you see that's melted there? Uh, again, it shouldn't make much of a difference, but with it being polyester, you never know, the actual part of the capacitor inside could have been melted by that. You know, a ceramic is hard, sturdy material, but polyester, from my understanding, is it's easy to melt. So that could be a problem, but it's not going to be affecting the volume, because that's only on one channel, and I think it, it's part of the um, feedback there, actually. So, and the sound sounds okay with respect to, it you know, it's been normal, but it's just low volume. Now, it's got a burr brown op amp on here. I'm just wondering if the characteristics of this are slightly different. Maybe if it's in another Archimedes model where maybe you've got 12 volts supplied to the board, which uh, provides the uh, positive, you know, you've got plus 12, minus 12 for the op amp there. It might be different. I don't think there's 12 volt. This just gets fed 5 volt, this board. So maybe this is why this is behaving differently, because it's got a different op amp there. So I've ordered uh, some, is it LM324? I think it is. I've ordered some op amps anyway. So when those arrive, we'll swap out that, swap out that, swap out that. Um, beyond that, I can't see anything that could be causing the actual issue. Um, uh, the caps won't be causing the issue. The only, you know, the volume level, it's got to be. It's got to be the op amp. It can't be anything else. I don't know what else it is, there's no traces cut, there's no components missing, um, and it's both channels, so 
bit of a mystery still. So I'm just reassembling this one while I wait for these uh, parts, but in the meantime I thought I'll deal with the LEDs. The LEDs on the keyboard are super dim. Um, I've just cleaned this membrane, just gently wiped it with some IPA. You've got to be careful with certain membranes on the Amiga, uh, in particular some of the Mitsumi ones. When as soon as you wipe this whole area of the membrane on the Mitsumi ones, it all comes off. The traces are actually exposed. On these, they're not, as I mentioned in the previous part here. Um, but if we just uh, gently wipe over these with some IPA. So I've vacuumed this out, I've skipped showing you. Um, I did this before in the previous video, just wipe over the legs of the LEDs here with a fiberglass pen. If we uh, do the ones down here, these make a connection with those uh, carbonized pads there on the membrane. If they aren't super clean and they're oxidized like these, you, you get really dull LEDs. You can hardly see them in the day. I might do before and after on one of these keyboards just to show you the difference it makes. It's like night and day. And if we hit the caps lock light now, look at that. That's. I wish I'd got a before shot, but you could barely see that. I put my hand over there, I could see it was illuminated. But now you can see it straight away. And it's the same with the num lock and the scroll lock as well. You could barely see those before. And the corrosion's got on here, look at that. Um, it might have done some trace damage, but primarily with... I've cleaned three or four of these up already. Uh, and it seems to be just, um, you know, getting onto the contacts and things. You seem to be able to just clean most of it off. So you can see here, this one's actually marked A3000 RAM extension Canon computing. So this is a third party one. And it's got a hand uh, written serial number there actually on that side. Uh, bare board tested. Well, why not test the board when it's populated? <laughs> yeah, anyway, that seems a bit weird. They must have had a, two different quality control checks. They checked it when it was bare and then someone tested it when it was assembled. Uh, I've got another one here as well. This is another third party one by the looks of things. You can see some of the prints at the top here. So it's not focusing very well. It says 1 slash 4 meg DRAM upgrade. KTO, is that so? Can't say it. KTO. I don't know. Um, so yeah, again, let's say third party. Oh, here you go. Pear tree. Yeah, pear tree. 1 slash 4 meg DRAM upgrade. Because all the modules are populated here, I would suspect that this is probably 4 meg, actually. And there's a little solder pad here, presumably you... Uh, used to determine whether it's 1 meg or 4 meg maybe but it might be dictated by the size of the modules maybe the, there's a module you can get that's the same package as that, the same pin count it's just larger capacity um, so you never know, it might just be 1 meg uh, anyway this one's pretty clean, it's just got a bit of fluff and dust but uh, yeah this is the main focus of this so we'll start with a little bit of uh, vinegar here So that's been soaking for a little bit. I've dried some of it off there. We've got bits of tissue paper and stuff. We'll just uh, try and mop some of that up with uh, cotton bud here just before I start trying to scrub this. But it's going to have a number of uh, you know passes in terms of cleaning. Um, we're going to use the uh, wire brush to start with here just because it's particularly crusty down here. And then I'll use the fiberglass pen. So as you clean them with some IPA, you can see, look how yellow the uh, paper is there, you can see a lot of flux coming off. It's starting to look really clean now, and the contacts on the bottom here are super clean. Right, so my parts have arrived, I've got the new Helen 324s, uh, 1 nanofarad and uh, 100 nanofarad. This one's the uh, polystyrene, or uh, is it polyester? I think it's classed as actually polyester caps, so we'll get those in there. So I've added some solder to the uh, two points there. One of them is uh, going to be easier to get to than the other. There's less of the leg exposed. You can see there the other one's bent over as well, which is a bit of a pain. Uh, anyway, let's, uh, let's just try and get the solder off that. And then I'll need to bend it up a bit. So I'm going to pull this cap from the other side, actually. That leg's a bit bent, which uh, makes it a bit harder to remove. And then we'll unblock the holes. It's just the easiest thing because that leg being bent, there we go. So you can see the cap there. The legs come out. Can you see that? The legs come out. That just goes to show that with these polyester caps, they are sensitive to temperature. 
but it could be that it's had a knock as well. I don't know why that leg's just come straight out like that. There we go, I'm just holding that cap uh, for the other side. You could bend the legs outwards, but you know what? I don't like bending the legs on the uh, caps uh, to get them to hold in place. It just frustrates someone when they try to replace the things. Anyway, that's that. Hold it in place with one. Solder, solder, solder the other one. I'm we'll going just roughly that one for good measure. That's it. Uh, just uh, press it just lightly from the other side, just uh, gently reflow those again. That's it, we can clean that with some uh, IPA now. Yeah, so that first one, we can't measure it because the leg just came straight out. So, you know, the top there's melted, don't you can see. So, yeah, that needed swapping out. I wouldn't like to leave it in there like that. Where's the other one gone? So I've got the other one here. Now, uh, I bought this recently to replace one that I loaned to somebody uh, many years ago. Um, I mean, I'm not too bothered that I didn't get it back, to be honest, because the guy gave me lots of stuff in the past, so um, it's one of those, it's ended up being a, a, an unofficial trade. Um, I think that this will, even though this is an ESR meter, it should at least measure the capacitance here. Um, or maybe not. Low capacitance. Let's just try the other one. Uh, this was, like I say, a purchase. I used some uh, Christmas vouchers to get this, actually. And it was to complete the set, because my good friends uh, Colin and Nathan... Um, you may remember that uh, Colin is the partner of Alison Shallis, um, and Nathan's his son. Uh, Nathan was helping Colin clear through some stuff of Alison's, and they provided me with these, uh, and I paid for these. So I Colin some money, uh, well Nathan actually, some money for these, so uh, it's not like I got them for free, and actually pretty much the price you'd pay for these, but I'd got a load of other stuff as well, so I did really well, I got some really good things here, and obviously these were Allison's and they were treasured uh, and loved, um, and they're really nice, the amazing thing is after all this time, um, the battery, <laughs> it still works on both of them, um, and funnily enough they use a little 12 volt cell, kind of like the ones you get in cameras and some old IBM PCs and compacts used to use them actually. Um, yeah, anyway, that one's the capacitance one, so let's uh, let's try that. All right, I lost the capacitor again there, uh, so let's, uh, let's connect this up. I'm guessing it's going to measure okay. I think this should be uh, 100 nanofarad. Or is, it, or is it 1? It might be 1, I can't remember. We'll soon find out 1. So, let's test that, see what it comes up with. It's taking a long time, isn't it? Yeah, two nanofarads. Bear in mind it should be one nanofarad. That's probably not far off what it should be. Let's just compare it though to one of the ones I replaced. So I'm not not sure whether this is the right type of uh, replacement for that. I'm guessing it's ceramic. It's weird. It's got a weird yellowy sort of package there. It was hard trying to understand from the uh, parts list for the uh, A3000 here what should be there. The other one, the um, the one you saw me change first, this, I'm sure is right, it is a polyester. It looks like that from the code in the parts list. Anyway, let's just test this replacement, see how near this comes to one. The other one was coming up to two, wasn't it? Yeah, it's a bit low that, isn't it? 700.1. Yeah, it's coming out a lot lower, that. Anyway, it will be okay. Uh, they are uh, marked as one nanofarad. The battery in this is obviously very old, so uh, I might need to check the batteries on these. But anyway, you should be seeing uh, more of these, thanks to Colin and Nathan, in uh, upcoming videos. Uh, and obviously, uh, my new ESR tester as well, so I've got <laughs> three of these now. There's a whole bunch of these you can get that do different things. They're really nice. So I've cleaned up the uh, pads there. Bear in mind, we lost a pad there. Um, it's not something I've done, it was uh, obviously because of the corrosion, it just came straight off with the cap. Um, got some brand new 33 nanofarad caps here, these are 1206's uh, actual size. I should have locked, oh there, I was going to say, I thought I'd put two down, I couldn't see where the other one had gone. This one here, I scraped a little bit of the trace, just going to the fire down here so we can mount it like that. Anyway, I'm not going to bore you with that, I'll just show you the result in a minute, I'll clean up. So I'll get that uh, new op amp in in a minute. I'm uh, curious to see if it's any louder with the original one. Because I don't see what else could be causing the uh, the low volume level on this one, actually. 
It's d definitely not those caps I've just replaced. Those won't be affecting the uh, volume level. For one thing, I think they only relate to one channel, you know, one side of the uh, thing there. So you'd have a mismatch if they were, but they're not in the right part of the circuit to be uh, affecting the volume or anything like that. Anyway, you can see that's uh, that's looking all right now. The main thing is we did clean up around here because it was considerably, uh, you know, these resistors and caps and things here were terrible. These two particularly needed swapping out totally. So you can you might just be able to see there was a tiny bit of kinar just from the trace to the bottom end of that cap there. So it's not quite as tidy and clean as it could have been, but you're always going to lose pads and things on these if you're not careful. The corrosion, you know, will just eat through things, and in some instances you do lose the pads. Anyway, that's looking uh, a lot better now, I think. Right, so we've cleaned up on both sides of the board there now. So we'll get an LM324 in there, just to stick that there for the moment. Let's uh, see if we can get this out of this socket. It's uh, at a really weird, annoying angle. You know, there's lots of things hindering me here. And let's just try and squash it back down a bit. That's uh, an important point that when you're trying to get chips out. If you can't get them out, the side you've lifted out on, try and push it back in a little bit like that. Because then you may find... There we go, it comes out a bit easier. There we go, that's our Burr Brown op-amp out. Yeah, there we go, so that's our LM324. Uh, let's carefully get that back into the socket. So let's uh, reassemble it and try it. So testing without the keyboard, I notice uh, a volume difference straight away. Just listen to the uh, volume here when it boots. When it goes doot. Yeah, that's really audible. Before, you could hardly hear that at all. So there's either something wrong with that op amp that was in there or it's not got the exactly the same characteristics as the original one, so, which we know it hasn't, but it's supposed to be almost identical. Um, anyway, the main thing is it sounds normal now. So rather than covering its own video, I thought I'd uh, merge it with this video. I've got four mice here. I need to get some mice working, so I've got some mice to send with these systems. You can see this one's kind of probably a no-hoper, unless the bits of plastic on the inside, I can reassemble that, but I doubt it. Um, so these are all Logitech mice. We've got uh, the flat, sort of square, tank-type uh, Logitech mouse there, and three like this. So yeah, they're super yellowed. I might retro them, I don't know. They do re-yellow if you don't keep them in uh, sunlight. If you put these in a dark uh, box in storage or something, they just re-yellow. So, anyway, um, I won't bore you with everything. I'm just going to tear these down, clean them up, um, clean the connections here, because each one's, well, some of them have got corrosion. I don't know if you can see that. Can you see this? Uh, I should put my hands like that there. Yeah, you can see one pin looking furry. Yeah, there's bits of corrosion on all of them. Um, some more than others, but we'll just do that and then I'll uh, test them, work out where the faults are, is it the cables, is it the balls, the balls look pretty good on these actually, I'll report back. So you can see straight away this one has had corrosion because it's looking uh, an awful colour there, so we'll uh, clean it with some vinegar first. I suspect on these it's going to be the cables that are broken actually, rather than just corrosion, but you never know, we could look out, it may well be that these were left connected to the uh, machines there and the corrosion has got into the mouse port and interfered with the connections here and that might be all that's wrong with them other than just a clean up needed. So uh, we'll now use the IPA, so I've got another cap here of IPA. And then the final thing I'll do is clean up the pins individually as you've seen me do before with uh, a single uh, socket pin, you know, it's, from, it's a turn pin connection basically. So let's uh, just try and clean that up a little bit now. And you can see there, look at the yellow that's just come off about there. But the outside will clean up a little bit better with uh, a fiberglass pen. Let's just uh, try and clean this up somewhat with the fiberglass pen here. Yeah, the marks have come off that. It's just a funny colour on one side. One side's kind of goldish, copperish, and the other side is silverish, which is a bit weird. So if I hold this uh, single pin here, like that, I can get a little bit of deoxy. 
on there like that and again we're covering old ground but you know just get it onto the pin there and just slide it up and down a few times like that on each pin careful not to bend or break them so then I brought it over to the Archimedes here, we'll plug it in and use it exposed like this. And what I want to do is just hold it and just move these here and see does it go left and right, does it go up and down, test the buttons, do the buttons work, and at the same time move the cable while I'm doing these things to make sure the cable's okay at both ends, not just here but at the side of the Archimedes as well. Because you've got light involved here, what you may need to do is protect ambient light by doing that, otherwise you might get weird movement. I'll show you that on the screen now. So yeah, any infrared light, and the camcorder is going to be producing some, that might be the answer, um, will interfere. You know, if I lift the top of that, it's, it becomes a bit more jerky, it won't go to the left very well. You know, it's moving right pretty easy, but not to the left. But if I cover over it with my hand, it's 100% responsive. I can go either way there without any issues. So if I try the other direction now, let's do the up-down. Yeah, that's working, look. And we'll test the three buttons, so... Uh, hang on, if I can press them. That's a left click, there we go, that's right. Right click, that's right. You can see because it changes to like two cursors in the middle one should bring up a little context menu if that's working. Yeah, there we go. So I think this one works. Um, I'll just clean this one up, reassemble it and then experiment with the cable, but I think there was just a bit of corrosion involved in that one. That's all it was, was just some corrosion on the pins. It seems fine. So the first one all works fine. You can see this one, look here, look how dusty and dirty it is in here. So yeah, it's no wonder these uh, aren't working. Um, the balls seem okay on them I think, so anyway, we'll pull the PCB out, let's get rid of that. I'll clean all that up. It's uh, much like the one I showed in my first video, so with these little springs here, look. Um, anyway, let's just get the ball out. Yeah, we need to just clean up that board, so I'm going to use the toothbrush on that and some IPA. So that's good progress really, we just left with uh, the uh, five or six motherboards to deal with now. The keyboards is a separate video, you know, I restored each one of the keyboards individually as well. So uh, yeah, they come out okay. I've got on there test, that one needs testing still. So there's one here I haven't tested, but all these others just came out pristine. So the first two of these came out looking pristine. The first one was already sold, so I didn't really have an opportunity to be able to film and show you the shell and stuff. It's just taken so much time and energy to go through these Archimedes. There's another five or six to look at yet. One of them I made significant progress on live stream, removing all the parts and stuff. I just need to find some motivation and some time to reassemble that one. Uh, one of them I'm going to be sending off to Dennis Vandenbroek. So you might see that on Dennis's channel at some point in the future. But it's, it's going to be a, a really huge undertaking for Dennis because there's uh, so much corrosion on those boards. And I might send one or two to other channels yet, I'm not sure. Or I might have to pass them on as spares repairs because these take so much time. You know, these Archimedes all arrived to me something like last October or November. And I've spent considerable amount of time on these since that time. And as you've seen, we've not really fixed very many. We've fixed like three A3010s and, and now two 3000s. But uh, the 3000s are the things that just take so much time. And the mice you saw within this video, there's just that one with a crack that couldn't be repaired. These are some of the other ones. I think that one's got the metal ball, hasn't it? Yeah, so you'll have seen that in a previous video. So that works fine. This one works fine. And uh, they've come out really well. I didn't retro bright them, I just cleaned them up with some oxy action. And they're a lot less yellowed. You can see my DIY scar cable here as well. Uh, I got an extender for this. There was one part, I think it was part one, where the, the, the Archimedes on its side, because the video wouldn't reach the TV. So I just got a uh, nine pin pass through there to extend it by a meter or two. So that's how I've been uh, tested. And as I showed in a previous video, SCART on these, if you want uh, your TV to switch into RGB mode, you need a, a, a voltage there. And there are n nothing really comes across that uh, you could actually use uh, to do that. So yeah, I can just add a 9 volt battery on there and that's uh, how I switch my uh, TV into RGB. Uh, and also I modified this cable here, as you can see, to add a 3.5 stereo audio lead so I can run the audio through the TV as well. So special thanks to Xavier for providing these. I'm still enjoying working on them, uh, but yeah, hence that, you know, obviously it takes so much time, that's why I'm having to have gaps in between them. It's, it's just uh, too much to do them all in one big, long go. 
So hopefully you found the video interesting. If you would like to support the channel, please see the Patreon and coffee links below. You can just perhaps buy me a coffee. Uh, every dollar makes a significant difference to me being able to continue to do these videos and stuff. Thanks very much for watching. Thanks for supporting me. I'll catch you in the next video.